I'll be reading from John 20, verses 19 through 31. <clears throat> that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. This is the word of the Lord. We will be looking at Jesus and particularly Jesus appearing to the disciples, Jesus appearing again with Thomas, particularly in mind. So I want to invite you to imagine with me this morning what it must have been like for Thomas in the text that Carmen shared with us. Thomas enters the upper room. He's ready to be near his fellow disciples in the wake of this incredible loss they are all experiencing. He's no doubt grief-stricken and bewildered at the death of Jesus. The text doesn't tell us where Thomas was prior to returning to the upper room, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch for us to imagine that Thomas wanted to be alone with his grief. We all process grief differently. We know the disciples are in fear of their lives. They've chosen to band together behind locked doors, safeguarded from the threat of the Jews. But Thomas was ready to die with Jesus in a previous chapter in the book of John. Jesus and the disciples had received word of their friend Lazarus and his illness. You'll recall that Jesus didn't go to Lazarus immediately, but he did announce to the disciples his intention to go to Bethany to be with Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. By this point in his ministry, Jesus had angered the religious authorities enough that he had been threatened with arrest and even stoning. The disciples knew that going to be with Lazarus and his sisters meant traveling to Bethany. And Bethany was a village many passed through on their way to Jerusalem and to the temple. Jesus would be vulnerable there. The authorities would be on the lookout for Jesus in Bethany. So his disciples did what most of us would do in that situation. They tried to dissuade Jesus from returning to Lazarus, from putting himself in harm's way. All of the disciples, that is, except for Thomas. Thomas stepped out courageously and loyally, saying, Let us also go that we may die with him. That said, I think it's unlikely that Thomas was paralyzed by the fear the other disciples experienced in the aftermath of Jesus' death. 
Thomas needed time alone to grieve the loss of his friend, his teacher, his Lord. But now it was time to gather with those closest to him, those experiencing the same loss. They could lean on each other. They could figure out where to go from here together. I suspect Thomas was anticipating entering a solemn gathering where his fellow disciples would be in mourning together. He must have been caught off guard by the excitement he discovered instead. Thomas, where have you been? You should have been here with us. We saw the Lord. We didn't believe our eyes at first. We thought he was a ghost or some hallucination, but he was real. Jesus stood before us alive. He showed us his wounds in his hand and his side. We don't have to be afraid anymore. There's so much more we need to tell you, Thomas. His heart sinking, Thomas stands amidst the commotion and celebration in disbelief. Jesus was here? He shows up among the crowds who retreated to the darkness of this room in fear of the Jews. Thomas thinks back to his willingness to die with Jesus at the time of Lazarus' death. Could this be Thomas's punishment for not following through on his bold pledge to follow Jesus even to death? Thomas considers that Jesus appeared to the other disciples leaving him out because of his fail failure to fulfill his commitment. He didn't re remain with Jesus until the end. But this group of deserting, deserting disciples, they failed Jesus too. They were no more reliable than Thomas abandoning the Lord in his greatest time of need. Thomas snaps at the disciples, I don't believe you. Unless I can see and touch Jesus for myself, none of this can be real. If I can touch the scars in our master's hands and feel the wound in his side, only then will I believe that he's alive. Boldly, Thomas demands an even greater experience than his fellow disciples had in seeing Jesus face to face. He decides that his faith in the resurrection of Jesus depends on his ability to see and to touch the Lord's wounds. Thomas calls on Jesus as a genie of sorts, a granter of wishes. He dismisses the faith of his fellow disciples in pursuit of his own experience with the risen Christ. We relate to Thomas in this way, don't we? We call on the Lord as a granter of wishes during times of desperation. And from time to time, we even hear stories where it seems God has responded. A success, successful young man with a promising career and a beautiful family hits rock bottom, losing everything that held meaning for him. His addiction has robbed him and his family of his home, his job. He has managed to alienate himself from those he loves most in the world. Without a clue where to turn, alone and discouraged, he seeks a word of reassurance from God. He turns in his Bible to a random page and reads these encouraging words from Isaiah. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. A couple decides to continue tithing faithfully despite the husband's recent demotion at work and their mounting medical bills for their sick child. Days before their medical bills are to be turned over to collections, they pray for a miracle. The next day, a trip to the mailbox reveals an envelope containing the exact amount of money they owe the hospital. A single mother running behind schedule to pick up her daughter from daycare prays for green traffic lights. 
She races to beat the clock and avoid the late pickup fines. She sails through each intersection, praising God for faithfulness in the small matters of life. She screeches into the daycare's parking lot just moments before their late fines go into effect. I don't know about you, but I can be dismissive of these sorts of testimonies. These testimonies that speak to God's involvement in our daily struggles. After all, if God is involved in the detail of the stories I just shared, where is God in times when we cry out in desperation? God can seem silent and inactive. We pray for the miraculous healing of a young mother ravaged by cancer and death comes anyway. We plead with God for a way out of the cycle of poverty even as we take on more debt to keep the lights on and the water running. We find ourselves in an abusive relationship, praying to God for some safe refuge, and we hear only silence. Where is our wish granting God in those circumstances? Maybe we overlook the countless ways Jesus comes to us in our times of struggle. Jesus appears to Thomas in exactly the way Thomas needs. In the same room where the disciples seek sanctuary from the Jews, Jesus comes again, turning his attention to Thomas. Touch my wounds with your finger, Thomas. Do not be unbelieving. Believe. Overwhelmed at the sight of Jesus, Thomas falls to his knees, confessing, My Lord and my God. Thomas doesn't need to touch the wounds of his Savior to believe. As Jesus offers his hands and his side to Thomas, Thomas sees the fullness of God in the risen Lord. His feelings of isolation, of missing out on an encounter with Jesus, vanish. Thomas won't give himself over to the crushing guilt of abandoning Jesus at the cross anymore. Thomas needed to see Jesus for himself. He didn't want to rely on the testimony of his fellow disciples any more than they wanted to rely on Mary Magdalene's experience with the risen Lord at the empty tomb. Thomas believed because of his personal experience with the Lord. Jesus acknowledges Thomas's belief and pronounces blessing over those who come to faith without such an encounter. Is this a word of hope? for those of us who struggle to see the Lord in our midst. At age 29, my friend Alana faced a recurrence of the cancer she fought tirelessly to destroy with her own stem cells just two years prior. Beating the odds again would require another grueling transplant, this time with donor cells. Incredibly, her younger sister, Lizzie, proved to be a perfect match for Alana. They gained admission to a leading stem cell treatment center. Family and friends braced ourselves for the painful and arduous process of fighting this disease for another round. The pieces to Alana's treatment plan fell into place so seamlessly that we felt secure in expecting the most hopeful of outcomes. God would grant another miracle. Lizzie and Alana would achieve an unbreakable bond in the act of giving and receiving new life. Alana would have a compelling testimony to the healing power of God. We called on God as grantor of wishes, and we anticipated healing and wholeness coming to Alana, albeit through a painful process. Preparing Alana's body to receive Lizzie's healthy stem cells took its toll. A regimen of toxic chemo and relentless radiation depleted her energy and at times her hope. She survived this tortuous time though. The transplant took place and we began celebrating the expectation of Alana's remission. 
We waited with great confidence. Alana remained in the treatment center for 30 days to ensure her body's acceptance of Lizzie's stem cells. Her odds of rejection were low given the fact that Lizzie was a perfect match for Alana. We considered this waiting period just a formality, a time to anticipate the full celebration of the miracle we had already claimed. We were wrong. Soon after the transplant, Alana's body began to show signs of rejection. Her doctors administered anti-rejection medications, each with their own set of side effects. Before long, we could see that her body was weary of the fight. For those of us closest to Alana, this was a confusing time. What was the point of Lizzie being a perfect match for Alana and enduring this painful process of donating her stem cells? Why would God allow Alana to endure such unbearable suffering again, only to deny her healing? Frustration with God and doubts about the love and nearness of God surfaced for those of us in the midst of this losing battle, but not for Alana. In those final days, she spoke of the grace of God. She shared how the unconditional enveloping love of her creator came to her in the form of a sister willing to sacrifice comfort and to set aside goals to offer help and wholeness to Alana. Just as Jesus came to Thomas, he came to Alana. Jesus did not come to Alana in bodily form, revealing his wounds and inviting her to touch them. But Jesus came to Alana in the way she needed. He appeared in the form of a family who put their responsibilities and ambitions on hold to focus their energy and love on her healing. Jesus came to her in the flood of emails, phone calls, and cards that she received from family, friends, and perfect strangers. Jesus came to Alana in the form of time to express her love and gratitude to those nearest her. Who are we to say how Jesus comes to those seeking faith? Jesus comes to each of us in a personal way. Jesus probably won't come granting wishes as we desire, but Jesus comes to us, oftentimes in greater and unexpected ways. You stumble to the door exhausted by another grueling day of tending to a colicky baby in one room and an ailing parent in another. Opening the door, you meet Jesus in the form of a neighbor delivering a home-cooked dinner. You dread going back to school this fall. You haven't had to deal with the ridicule and the bullying all summer. Before entering the building, you take a deep breath and brace yourself for enduring yet another year of humiliation and isolation. And out of nowhere, Jesus comes in the form of a friendly new face. Hi, my name is Emily. I'm new here and could really use a friend. You look like you could too. You emerge from the doctor's office stunned by the diagnosis and Jesus is there in the waiting room in the form of friends who will walk this journey with you. Jesus comes to us in love and grace and in the fullness of God. Jesus appears and we cannot help but echo the confession of a believing Thomas, my Lord and my God. Would you pray with me? God, we come before you thankful this morning that you are a God of nearness. We are grateful for Jesus appearing in personal ways to his followers in scripture. And we're grateful for the ways Jesus continues to appear to us today. 
unexpected ways, ways we don't even know that we need at times. God, grant us an awareness of your presence in our own lives and a courage and a willingness to be the representatives of your presence in the lives of others. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.